course we're going to do. All right, we're recording. So with that, I want to introduce um, Chad Page. Some of you guys maybe know him. I know, Isabella, you probably do because you were on the um, Sheep and Go AI workshop that we did. And so Chad was gracious and helped teach part of that in the beginning. And so um, he's been super supportive of our efforts in the Animal Science 1009 class and both with the labs that we did as well as the lecture. And so we're thankful that he's willing to jump on and help with that. Um, Chad's a graduate student at the University of Wyoming. Um, he comes from Arizona, the warm weather to the cold weather. And um, he's working with Whit Stewart in the sheep department at UW on his um, graduate program. So with that, I'll let him maybe add a little bit to that. And then um, we'll let Chad go over the goat breeds. So then at that point, if he wants to get off and not stay on, you can chat if you want, or you can stay on whatever you feel. And then from there, we'll take a little shift and go over the swine part of it after he's finished. So thanks for doing this, Chad. <clears throat> well, thank you, Don. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I just, I think Don got it right. I, I'm from Arizona. I grew up around um, sheep and goats, mainly goats. Um, so I enjoy goats, uh, even though I get a lot of flack for it in grad school, but um, I really do like goat breeds um, and what goats can bring to the table. So um, I will stay on after because I don't know anything about pigs. So I'll, I'll stay on and listen to swine. Um, but I guess if we don't have any questions, um, we can just get right into it. So, how do I share? There should be like a button at the bottom. It's usually like green. If you roll your cursor at the bottom, usually it'll pop up. Like a little green button that says share. At least it's always green on mine. Sometimes it doesn't go live if you don't roll your cursor around to try to find it. Oh, there you go. Okay. Yep, you're good. So, did it go to a full screen now? Yep, you're good. Perfect, thanks. Okay. So, <clears throat> today we're mainly just going to focus on breeds of goats that are popular in the United States. Um, Wyoming really isn't a big goat state, but um, they're, and goats aren't the most popular breed of animal or species of animal in the U.S., but um, there are quite a few of them as we'll learn. Um, basically, goats are broken down into several categories. The three main categories are, are meat breeds, dairy breeds, and fiber breeds. So this is much like the sheep industry um, in that meat breeds are the most dominant um, use of goats in the United States right now. Uh, a while ago, dairy breeds of goats actually used to dominate um, the landscape across the U.S. in that we would use goats for dairy purposes and then we would we would use them for meat. Um, but things have kind of switched um, courses a little bit and now dairy, uh, dairy goats is less common in the U.S. than it used to be. Um, and then fiber breeds, there are a couple different fibers that we'll learn about that are that come from goats, uh, whereas sheep uh, produce wool, goats produce uh, two different fiber types. And there's also other purposes that people have goats um, in the US, one of them being as a pack animal. Um, a lot of people kind of laugh at this, a lot of big hunters that I know, but um, goats are great pack animals and the fact that they can carry a very large percentage of their body weight, um, roughly 50% of their body weight, and also the fact that they don't have the same um, dietary requirements or um, water requirements that horses or pack mules would have. Uh, so that way you can actually bring them into very arid environments and they can just roughage and eat what's around and really not have a large requ a water requirement at all. So very, very interesting in that. And then another purpose is also brush control. 
there's actually a couple companies here in Wyoming that have done very well in this. Um, one of them is out of Cheyenne. I believe it is called um, Green Goat LLC. And they have many contracts um, both here in Wyoming and down in Colorado. And that all they do with their goats is bring their goats into very overgrown areas with a lot of brush and weeds and have their goats graze that and uh, they get paid for it. They don't even really slaughter any of their animals. Uh, they let their goats grow old and the old goats teach the young goats what to eat and how to get around the different places. So those are some basic categories of how we utilize goats in the U.S. Um, kind of a broader look on goats overall and the, across the world, uh, we'll see goat numbers higher in those kind of countries that are still we consider developing countries. So if you can see my cursor on the screen, um, Asia and Africa have a much higher goat population than even sheep population. And uh, China is the number one sheep producer in the world, uh, far and away, even more than Australia. But they actually have more goats there than any other, um, than any other animal. So it goes to show how many goats are actually um, in the world and what a large amount of goat is actually eaten. Um, if we look more specifically at the United States, um, I want to direct your attention to this upper corner um, in the black, uh, black, uh, black square. So there are roughly 2.6 million goats in the U.S. right now, which isn't a lot compared to um, our sheep numbers or definitely our cattle numbers in the U.S. But 80% of those goats in the U.S. are specifically for meat production. And only 15% are for dairy goats. And I talked earlier about before the percentage was by far um, more dairy goats in the U.S. and we used to just kind of slaughter those dairy goats and and use for meat production. Um, another segment of the goat industry that has really fallen is the fiber aspect of it. So one of that specifically being angora goats that make mo mohair. Um, that only consists of five percent of the goat population here in the U.S. Now one thing about this number with goats in the U.S. Uh, it's hard to really know if this number is accurate because there's a lot of smaller uh, families or farms that have goats on them that don't really let um, report how many goats they have. And probably the average size of a goat uh, population on one farm is probably 40 to 50 head of goat goats. So it's really hard to know how accurate this number is. And we um, definitely think that it is higher than what is actually being reported. But this is pretty recently as of 2018. So <clears throat> if we look at the bottom of the screen, our boxes uh, outlined in red, um, representing Texas and Tennessee, are the two highest um, meat producing, meat goat producing states in the US. But Texas is far and away the winner. Um, producing 38% of all meat goats in the U.S. And Tennessee um, is still in second place, but they only produce 5% of all the meat goats in the U.S. So you can see how Texas um, is very good goat country. Um, if we look at dairy goats, the next biggest population of goats in the U.S., uh, Wisconsin is winning there. And this is of no surprise because uh, Wisconsin is known for their cheeses and dairy goats make a lot of um, very uh, niche cheeses and uh, artisan cheeses. So they have 12% of all the dairy goats in the U.S. And then California is right behind them with 11% of the dairy goats in the U.S. Um, now, here's where I get to brag a little bit on Arizona. Um, because Arizona is usually not known as a very good ag state, especially in livestock. But uh, Texas, after Texas, uh, Arizona comes into second place with the number of angora goats um, that they have. 
So Texas has more than half of the Angora goats in the United States, but uh, out of the other half that remains, half of that is uh, coming from Arizona. So that's, that's a little bit exciting for me because I am from Arizona. Um, but out of all the goats in the U.S., 34% of them, of all these different categories, 34% of all goats come from Texas. So that is a very large percentage of our goat population that comes from one state specifically. So let's get into our meat breeds. Let's talk about some of our breeds and what they bring to the table in these different markets uh, for goats. So the most common and what I think most of you um, have a lot of experience with is, uh, is boar goats. So if any of you are in 4-H or are showing animals, this will be the breed of goat that is dominating the show rings, really. Um, and it was originally brought in from South Africa, where it was developed, into the United States in 1993. And since then, it has really been um, what they say one of the good reasons why meat goat production has really taken off in the U.S. And it brings a lot of really good characteristics for the show ring. It is really well muscled. Um, it's also one of those breeds that breed, uh, that can kid out of season. Um, not a lot of breeds of goats can do that, but a, the boars do a pretty good job at kidding out of season. Um, and then, but along with that, um, as it's been brought into the U.S. and we've used it for our own purposes, it has lost some of the hardiness that it originally had in South Africa. And so we've actually taken the boar and we've been crossing it with some of the other breeds that are specific uh, to the United States. And it's helped us retain all the really good qualities of the boar goat, uh, the muscling, the out of season kidding, and um, retain those, but also give it some more hardiness so it does better on a more production setting. But boar goats have a very distinct look to them, that white body with the red markings on the head. And um, that is generally what you will see. So one of the goats that we cross boars on quite often is the Spanish goat. And Spanish goats here in the United States have a very long history. Um, back when the Spanish explorers, uh, Cortez came over, he brought goats and they released them in the southern U.S. around the Texas area. And for hundreds of years, those goats kind of went unchecked as just a wild breed of goat. And so they became a very hardy animal. They could deal with very harsh conditions, but um, they were a little bit more smaller framed. And so by taking that hardiness that they have, uh, a lot of times we'll cross them over uh, to the boar goats and we'll get a very well muscled animal. So a lot of the big producers in Texas that have range operations where they're having uh, these goats for brush control will have some kind of Spanish cross. Um, so really this is a very an Americanized goat, even though it's called a Spanish goat, it was developed here in the US. Um, the pictures I have up are of black Spanish goats, which you see a lot of, but really any uh, kind of breed of goat that is kind of uncategorized, that's used for brush control and out on a range situation will usually just kind of be called a Spanish, Spanish goat. They come in all sorts of colors um, and sizes depending on the conditions that they're in, but they're generally a smaller framed goat. So that is one goat that is very impressive. The males will have um, a nice big, big horn set. Um, another goat is the Kiko goat. And the Kiko goat is fairly new to the United States, similar to the boar goat. So in the 1990s, um, the Kiko was first imported to the U.S., but its origins come from New Zealand. Um, there was a bunch of uh, feral goats running the countryside in New Zealand, and a group called GoX, um, GoX Group LLC uh, captured these animals, and they began breeding them uh, for reproductive purposes, but also for muscle growth. And they developed this breed of goat 
um, that did very well in many types of conditions, um, both up in the mountains and more in arid regions also. And this goat is kind of a go anywhere, uh, eat anything type of goat. And so bringing those into the US offers another set of very hardy, large framed goats that we could cross um, onto some of our goats and do very well in much of the conditions, especially in the Southern United States and Southeastern portions. Um, Kikos are also supposed to be pretty parasite resistant, which is a good thing for goats because a lot of goats suffer from parasites and we're, so we're constantly trying to treat them. But Kikos are one of those goats that tend to do better in, uh, with parasites. So, so those three goats that we just talked about, the boar goats, um, Spanish goats, and Kikos, those are the three meat type goats that really dominate the scene as far as numbers in the United States. And you can see how their different attributes um, can really bring a lot to the game. And the fact that the boar is so well muscled and can kid at different times of the year, um, the hardiness of the Spanish and the Kiko goats, the large frame of the Kiko goats. And so they all bring something really good to the table. Um, another really well-known, uh, pretty U.S. breed type goat is the Mitonic goat or fainting goats. This breed was really kind of developed in Tennessee in the late 1800s is kind of when it kind of became its own breed. And it really adapted to the environment. They're usually a little bit smaller framed animals, um, but they have a recessive gene that uh, when they get excited or they get, um, they get scared, they'll stiffen up um, for a couple seconds. And so they're often called Tennessee fainting goats. In this picture here, it shows this goat, looks like it faints and they don't go unconscious, so they don't really faint. Um, but they do get stiff-legged and fall over. So it's pretty amusing to see kids try to do that. So they'll be called wooden-legged goats, stiff-legged goats, or nervous and scared goats. Um, some of those goats have moved over to Texas and they started breeding them more for muscling and for size. And those kind of began uh, to be called the Tennessee meat goat is what they've been um, calling them and kind of bred specifically for meat purposes. Um, they have a pretty high meat to bone ratio um, from some of the research that I've read. Um, so these goats have been doing really well <clears throat> in the meat production world, but they've developed in the United States. So they do very well in the U.S., um, especially in these areas like Tennessee and Texas. So the Tennessee meat goat, because it's been selected for size, um, and it also is pretty parasite resistant, kind of like we talked about with the Kikos. Um, some people, specifically a ranch in Texas called Onion, Ke Onion Creek Ranch, has been crossing them with boar goats, a pretty high percentage of boar. And as you can see in these pictures, it makes a very well muscled uh, buck. And so they come in various sizes um, and shapes, but it's usually a, a lot larger framed than the original Tennessee Mitonic goat, because now we're dealing with those Tennessee meat goats that are a little bit larger, but you can see how some of the color patterns from the Mitonic goats have crossed over. Um, and so they come in various uh, coat lengths and various coat colors and patterns. Um, but a lot of times you'll see either a boar pattern or a, a black and white type pattern. So moving on into some of the dairy breeds, here's a, a picture of the various things you can make with goat milk. Um, even shaving products, products you can make, cheeses, um, yogurts, and so you see a lot of these at farmers markets. Um, but moving into that, probably one of the most well-known is the Alpine. Uh, the Alpine is kind of the basis of a lot of different dairy breeds that are common in the U.S. The Alpine comes in a lot of different colors and patterns, and all of them are acceptable, except a couple different patterns that are specific to other breeds that originated from the Alpine. 
Um, so one of those color patterns is from the Toggenberg, and the other is an all white color uh, that's from another breed we're going to talk about very shortly. Uh, but they are known as being some of the most prolific milkers as far as volume of milk. So they're almost like the Holstein of the dairy goat world, per se. So, <clears throat> and the Alpines are also one of those animals that are commonly used for pack animals. Um, just their nature and how they're willing to follow. Um, generally, people that use them as pack animals will train them young, um, and they'll wean them off their moms early and train them young as pack animals. And they'll, a lot of them seem to keep their horns on. And I think that has to do with um, protection out in the wild if they need it. Um, but that's something that uh, a breed that's commonly used for pack animals, it seems. Another um, breed that is pretty new in the US and has only been recognized as a breed in the US since 2007 is the Guernsey. Um, the Guernsey is a breed rig really originating from um, Britain or England. And the way we first got the Guernseys, the genetics of the Guernseys into the United States is through an embryo that was put into a Spanish doe in Canada. And when that doe kitted, we brought that kid into the US. Um, and those were some of the first genetics. But a lot of the Guernseys and breeders in the United States have developed their Guernsey, um, Guernsey flocks uh, purely from um, breeding up. So they'll take a, a similar dairy type breed, maybe an Alpine or something else, and they'll breed them with Guernsey genetics um, from across the Atlantic and over time, they will get a breed that is very similar to the original uh, Golden Guernsey that was developed in Britain um, some time ago. La Mancha, um, the history isn't super well known, but if you go back way in history, back into uh, even Persia times, a long time ago, there is instances of goats without ears or short-eared goats. but um, similar to the Spanish goats, goat, these type of goats were brought over on the West Coast and have really developed to be um, the American La Mancha. So they're, they have been developed in the U.S. to what we really know them as now. Um, they come in also a variety of colors and patterns, but the most distinct thing about La Manchas are, uh, are those ears. So... With La Manchas, we have two types of ears. We have an elf ear, which is on this kid here in the bottom corner, and then we have gopher ears, which are the short, uh, tight ears cropped right in. Um, only bucks uh, that are registered, uh, those bucks that get registers have to have gopher ears. Elf ears are not really allowed in registration for bucks. Um, so if any of you own La Manchas, I grew up with La Manchas, um, and so I've been around them quite a bit, and I've seen both versions of these ears. But they are also very good milkers and do good in a lot of different climates, both hot and cold. Pygmy goats. Um, pygmy goats, it's debatable sometimes whether they're really considered a meat breed or a dairy type breed. And I think in the U.S., a lot of people just kind of use them as a pet more than they do um, really for milk production or other thing. But they originally have an African origin, uh, Western Africa. But the first pygmy goats were actually brought from Cameroon, um, France. So a French Cameroon uh, dwarf goat is what they originally called. And they range anywhere from 15 to 20 inches tall. So they're pretty short. Um, guys, they have pretty dense bones. They're pretty stocky looking, and they only weigh anywhere from 35 to 60 pounds. I'm sure some of us out there have dogs that weigh much more than these than these goats. Um, but similar to these pygmy goats, another breed of dwarf goats is the Nigerian dwarf, uh, originating from a similar area in Africa. But if you look at this show picture here at the bottom, it's very distinct. It's distinctly different 
from that pygmy breed of goat. And the fact that it's proportioned much like a larger breed of goat, it's just also very small. Um, so what's really interesting about these goats is they are very prolific milkers. Um, they milk three to four pounds a day. So roughly half a gallon of milk every day. And a lot of people I know that have these goats that milk them um, for their homes and day-to-day -day basis, they swear that for some reason, uh, these goats don't pass that same taste into their milk. So, you know, if your alpine goat or Nubian goat got into onions, your milk would taste like onions. For some reason, um, people that own Nigerian dwarfs say that that doesn't happen to the same extent. So their milk is more consistently tasting the same than other breeds of goat, depending on what they eat. And also with that, um, triplets and quadruplets are very common in this breed of goat, um, which is outstanding, outstanding based on their size. Um, so they're pretty good little goats for those people who want one for a backyard milker or um, other purposes. Nubians are far and away the most popular breed of dairy goat in the U.S. They're originally a cross between different British breeds of goats and then Asian, Indian, and some African breeds that came in to England before we imported them into the United States. Um, they also are prolific milkers. They don't milk quite the same volume as alpines, but they have the highest fat uh, content in their milk at 4.6%, whereas most other goats are sitting at the low 3% uh, mark. Ober, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, uh, Ober Hosley. If any of you girls out there know how to say this, uh, feel free to correct me. But uh, this is a Swiss breed. Um, it's been recognized in the U.S. as a breed since the 1970s, uh, about 1980. And, oops, sorry. And it has a very distinct color pattern. So you can see it has that brown color and it, uh, several shades of brown are pretty acceptable there. But the distinct black markings across the whole back, across the face and on down the legs. Um, so some of the bucks or some of the does can be a pure black color. Um, but for registration, none of the bucks uh, can be like that. So the bucks have to be this distinct color pattern that is known for this breed. Uh, Sanin is another breed. Uh, this is that all white coat color that is not acceptable for alpines generally because the Sanin is known to have this specific white color breed. As you can look at the udders on some of these girls, they are also very prolific milkers, um, but they're always a white or cream colored. And uh, be, they originally originated from, people say, from alpines. So they have very similar characteristics as far as the way they look. The only difference is they are always that white, white color. A sable, on the other hand, is also from an alpine, but it is essentially just a colored seinen. Um, so those seinens that maybe uh, have gotten a recessive color gene uh, are essentially a sable, and they have their own breed registry now, but they're, they're very much uh, the same animal in my eyes, and they come in a lot of var variation of colors and patterns, um, kind of like the alpine. The Toggenberg is, uh, is that other color pattern that is not um, acceptable in the Alpines uh, because it is specific to this breed of goat that is originated from this, a similar place in Switzerland known as the Toggenberg Valley. Um, and this specific breed as a breed has been known as one of the oldest dairy breeds. Um, but it's very distinct with that kind of uh, cream slash brown color and the distinct white markings down the side of the face from on top of the eyes all the way all the way down. So moving on into our last uh, section is fiber breeds and so these fiber breeds of animal the first one uh, that we know is Angora. So this is what was reported for Texas having the largest amount of them and then Arizona and Angora goats produce mohair. Um, maybe some of you uh, 
uh, know people that have mohair sweaters or cardigans, but this breed is very old and goes back even into the fifth century in Turkey. And then uh, it had moved around throughout Europe and eventually came to South Carolina in the mid 1800s. So this used to be a more popular breed of goat because of uh, the fiber that it produced. And the numbers have really declined in the US over recent years. Uh, much like sheep, producers used to get a subsidy or some money back from the government when they would sell wool. Well, the people who had Angora goats would get the same deal. And oftentimes they would be shearing these animals twice a year because they grow this fiber so fast. Cashmere is the other product that goats uh, produce, the other type of fiber. And all goats can grow cashmere. Uh, the majority of goats, aside from our Angora goats that are growing uh, mohair, uh, this cashmere is that undercoat during the winter. So throughout the winter, they build it up and in the spring, they shed it off. So you can brush out this cashmere. Um, but the animals that we consider cashmere goats are essentially a breed of goat that has been selected over time to grow a very large amount of cashmere uh, during the winter. And it has to be a certain uh, width um, or fiber diameter, kind of like wool, very fine and a certain length and a certain crimp, also a lot like wool. And so those are what is selected for over time to get cashmere type goats. Uh, this is a picture of lady in Mongolia uh, that produces cashmere goats and they produce a lot there. Um, but those are really only the two breeds of uh, goats that are producing fiber. But cashmere goats, it can really be any breed aside from, um, from our Angora goats that all breeds produce some uh, cashmere to some extent. So, yep. But that is essentially the gist of the breeds throughout the US. Um, if you had any questions, on a certain breed, I'd be happy to answer that. Um, maybe after the class, if Don wants to allow that. But uh, that's what I have for now. I think is a good overview of what we have in the US and how we utilize those animals and the different properties that each breed can bring to the table if you decided to get that breed um, or not, so. Perfect. Thanks, Chad. Does anybody have questions? Um, I have one question. Yes. So you said the sable goat is derived from the alpine? Uh, yeah, but more so from... Because uh, um, my understanding was the sable goat is derived from the sonnen breed. Right, right. So I was going to say more so from the sonnen. So colored sonnens are essentially sables, um, but their ancestry can go back to that same area where alpines were but they they are not derived directly like you like you said it's more so from that son and that's the direct um amount but long-term genetics they can go back to alpines okay that's what i was thinking because yeah um aren't the alpines and sonnens they both originate in switzerland but from different areas due to the geographical location correct? exactly Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank Rebecca, you. do you raise goats? Um, yeah, actually I do dairy goats and, uh, yep, and meat goats. So that's awesome. why I was asking, because like, I was like, I don't think, like, I don't know, it's slightly confusing how you presented your facts, but I got you now. Yeah, no, I, I am, I, I tried to present it in that same way that you just said it. Um, but if it didn't come clear, that's sorry. But uh, you are correct in the fact that it is directly from the Sanin, but uh, long-term ancestry, uh, the Alpine, the Sanin, and Sable all kind of come from the similar areas. So right, as Swiss, Swiss type dairy goats. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So it's the night chat for you because you actually have four kids on that raise goats. So it's actually kind of a crazy deal. So anyways, that's well, awesome. Awesome. They should fact check me. 
Yeah, so no, I like that's that, I like to let Rebecca called me out. That's exactly what you need to learn to do. So yeah, no, that's perfect. All right. Any other questions for Chad? All right. So if Chad, if you can quit sharing your screen. Okay. Um there should be a button that says quit sharing. I okay. can't see it on my, oh, there you go, good job. All right, perfect. Um, we're gonna shift gears and um, uh, go into the swine part of this. So I'm just seeing if I can get the screen to share. Perfect, oh, whoops. Perfect, can everybody see that? Okay, so um, can you guys hear me still too? Yep, okay, perfect, okay. So the swine breeds tonight, like I maybe took them a little bit of a different direction, um, just to kind of get a little bit of a history of swine breeds because I think that um, many of the ones that are common in the US are ones, or common are, um, ones that were imported and many of the ones that were developed in the United States are maybe you guys haven't even heard of. So I kind of did it as a separation so you could understand a little bit about uh, pigs in general. And um, I also know there's a couple kids that raise pigs on here. So I thought that was kind of, a, I, there's a few fun fast facts that really don't. So just a little bit of history of pigs in general to start with is that pigs actually developed, um, you know, millions of years ago and they really developed separately and that's quite different than many of the other species. And so there was a group of pigs that developed in Western Asia and they were really called the wild boar type pigs. And if you look at that picture, not very appealing um, to what we know of pigs today. Then there was a set of pigs that developed in China. And then from there is there was a set of pigs that developed in the, um, Europe that was actually where they took the, West, the Asia pigs and crossed them with the China pig to come up with a new pig. So the pig you see there on the bottom is actually a pig from the Philippines, but basically that was a cross between those other two. And the ones that got imported into the United States were actually that cross. And so the first pigs came to the United States by the Spanish, um, and they actually came not to the United States, to North America, into the southern part of North America. And then what happened was is they escaped, basically. And so then they became wild pigs and does anybody know I'm gonna make you guys be hopefully more interactive. Does anybody know what a wild pig is called? Does anybody know even today in the United States what's a wild pig called? Does anybody know? Nobody knows. So feral hogs. And so uh, that's what they were known as feral hogs. And in the beginning is that they really immediately became a nuisance to the Indians because they weren't here and uh, if we're gonna talk about feral hogs a little bit, but they definitely tend to root up things and that they, they do kind of what they want, they're kind of uncontrollable. So in the beginning, in the colonial times, when the pigs first came over, is those first pigs came from the Spanish, they were called feral hogs. They moved from the south into what we now know as the United States. And about that same time, um, what happened was is that, that Christopher Columbus came over, um, the pilgrims came over and then they brought some pigs with them as well. But in the beginning, all those pigs were free and they literally ate plants, acorns, roots. Um, they have a mono gastric digestive system, so they still had to have those, they ate bugs, things like that. But they literally uh, did what they wanted and they weren't in fences much or anywhere. Um, so they tried to keep them housed and were unsuccessful at that. So they soon started creating laws, and back then it was interesting to think they had pig laws clear back that long ago, but they started having the um, early settlers do split ears, and what do we call that? So when we take a part of the ear out today, what do we call that? We still use that today in today and age. What's it called? Ear notching. Ear notching, exactly. So it's ironic to kind of think about the concept that ear notching started many, many, many years ago as a way to ID those pigs. They also invented the first nose rings because the idea of putting the nose rings in the pigs was why. What was the purpose of putting a nose ring in? Does anybody have a guess? Yeah, to stop them from rooting, right? And we're going to talk about rooting a little bit, but that was the goal of it is to stop them to quit destroying the land and property is really the purpose. So what happened though is from there, um, it, the pigs really developed and they started moving. And so they started to move west more. Um, the Indians soon discovered that pigs liked corn 
And so it was a great way that they could capture them, put them in housing, and that they could um, fatten them out faster because they had corn to do that with. So in the 1800, late, mid 1800s into the early 1900s is when pigs really started to grow in the United States. Is there was the first packing plant developed, which was quite interesting that the first packing plant was that early on. Um, and then the pigs even continued to move farther to Chicago because of the railroad. So the railroad soon made it so that they could move those um, pigs along. And um, back then, early on, is most of those pigs were purebreds. And we're gonna talk about breeds in a minute, but most of them that they were um, feeding out, that they were raising to market were considered purebred pigs. Um, today, if that is very much different. Um, and there's a picture there of what confinement looks like is um, instead of being pigs that were raised on property or free rangers or whatever you want to call them is that now they're in confinement with slotted flo floors. There's automatic feed, there's waste management, there's biosecurity. Um, many hog farms don't even allow outside people to come into them. And so really, if you can see the difference, we're gonna show you a couple more slides that really compare the difference between where the pigs started and where they are today, and it's interesting. But it's also connected to why we have the breeds that we have in the US. So early on, pigs became popular because they were hardy, they were prolific. And what does that mean? Who knows what prolific means? Anybody? Is it like they reproduce well? Yeah, reproduce quickly and large litters, right? We're gonna learn that that's not the case in all breeds, but they were very much um, a prolific, which means that they could reproduce and that they could, could get them to market or slaughter quickly. Um, they liked corn, which was great. Um, pork was also easily preserved, that they could preserve it with salt, um, they could smoke it, they could cure it, so they had the ability to store it. Um, the other part back then is different than our diet, is Pork was high in fat, which they wanted back then because they wanted a lot of calories in their diet. Um, and so their food system wasn't as obviously as developed as ours. And so um, that was a popular thing from them. Also, they used the lard for candles and soaps and cookings and things like that. So today, the pork industry still is definitely not as big as the poultry industry. It's the poultry industry is bypassed pork by far, but um, it continues to be a popular food product in the United States. Um, and honestly, that there's a high feed conversion, which means what? Who knows what that means? What's a high feed conversion mean? Doesn't that mean that it takes less amount of food to get a greater amount of weight gain? Correct, exactly. So in sheep, and Chad might have a different number, but when I teach kids about using a standardized feed that's that's made for kids using 4-H projects. It's, it depends on the feed, but some are between five to seven to get a pound a gain. So that lamb has to eat about five pounds to get a pound a gain, okay? In pigs, it's clear down to three. And, and so that's, it's a high feed conversion that they gain weight more quickly. They can produce large numbers on less acres, which is the confinement situation. Um, there's a shorter time frame from birth to market, which makes them appealing. That's why the poultry industry is super appealing, right? It's because they even have a shorter time turnaround. Um, and consumers still want it. So in the pork industry, um, the driving force behind pork is really bacon, sausage, and a lot of byproducts, which is interesting in that. So um, bacon really is a driving force of the, of the pork industry today. So this just shows it in a different way of how the pork industry has changed, and I think that's interesting, and why we have the breeds that we have in the United States is in the beginning, they were lean and lanky, then they took them and they crossed them and they became these fat roller type pigs, then they become more of a meat type today. In housing, they were free roaming. Then we put them in pastures. Now they're in total confinement. Um, in the beginning, they ate roots, berries, nuts, acorns, things like that. Then they started feeding them just ear corn, um, which was from the Indians and early on those settlers. And today we do a corn soy diet, which is, helps with that rapid weight gain. Um, and then back then, the marketing is, is they would herd them all and they put them in, in droves. So basically, they'd round them up and then um, that's when they would slaughter them or trade them back then because they didn't really have a market type thing. Then we started selling pigs at stockyards and now that's pretty uncommon. There's still, our livestock markets still have pigs that go through there that are the small family owned, smaller things. But the majority of our confinement situations are sold directly to packers. So there's a big change in the pork industry. Um, that's just kind of another thing. The other thing on this slide that it shows you is that the breeds early were purebreds. Now the majority of the pigs in those confinement situations are crossbreds. And obviously there was a lot more smaller farmers and now we have a lot 
fewer hog producers and they're definitely larger. So those are some changes I think that are interesting. So when we think of pigs, they really are raised for meat, which is the number one thing. That those numbers I think are huge when you look at the number or the pounds of product that are produced is that we slaughtered 121 million pigs last in 2017. And then that's about 25 billion pounds of meat. And then we exported $6 billion worth of pork, um, which is huge. Also from the pork is with any animals is we use everything pretty much. So there's a lot of byproducts that come from that. Um, leather, car seats, band-aids, buttons, all those type of things. Um, pigs are also raised for pets and exhibition. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, there's a percentage of pigs that are raised to improve breeding stock. And then obviously pigs are the one animal that is connected to humans. And so there is a health component. It's not huge, but there is a health component as far as we use pig skin for grafts and we use um, their organs or things like that for to aid human um, health. And so those are still continuing in research. I think that's just an area that will continue and continue. So um, on the bottom, it's just, I think it's interesting to see the top producing states, it's definitely not Wyoming, right? We're a little cold. Um, and that we're not connected to the packing plants as well and things like that. So back there in the Midwest is where the predominantly the highest producing states are. Um, so the pigs that originated, we're going to jump into breeds. And so the pigs that originated in the United States, which means that they were developed here, is not very many. But that's not typical. Of, as you, um, Chad said, there's not a lot of goat breeds that typically were developed here either. So. Um, not very many mothering ability pigs, which means those are pigs that are raised for their um, mothering ability. That means milking, prolific, things like that. None of those were developed in the United States. Mainly they were carcass, and this the Chester White, Duroc, Hereford, Poland China, American Yorkshire, and the spotted pigs. And those are pretty common still in the United States, most of those. We're gonna talk about each of those, and some have fewer numbers, but, and then I didn't know how to classify the bottom. Uh, Chad put other in the goat world, right? I put the hobbyists because I don't, they really don't have a huge purpose, but they still exist. Is there's these five breeds of pigs that were developed in the United States and they still exist in the United States. Um, four of them are very old, the top four there. And the last one, the Idaho pasture pigs we're gonna talk about in a minute are super new. So it's kind of interesting to me. So we're gonna talk about some of those and, and I put those on purpose because maybe you guys have never heard of them. I personally don't know a lot about those pigs. I mean, as far as learning about them, um, I've only seen a few of them ever. So um, with that is that, that we're just gonna kind of highlight these and, and these pigs. And what I hope you guys gain from this is how you can tell pigs apart. Um, so there's some distinguished factors because if you look at a white pig, what is a white pig? It looks like a white pig. But when we look at white pigs, we're gonna identify the purpose and identify features about them that tell them apart. So the Yorkshire is one of the largest numbers of pigs in the United States. Um, there's more Yorkshire than there is any other breed out there. They're white and you can see they have the erect ears there, if you can see that. Um, they originated in, from an English Yorkshire breed and they were brought in in crossbreds and they're one of the oldest breeds, 1802, so they're pretty, they've been here a really long time. In the beginning they weren't popular because they were slow growers, but as we crossbred them and developed that breed that's definitely changed and they're definitely um, became the most popular and, and that growth rate has definitely improved. Um, the Chester White, I just think is a fun breed. Um, they are common still in the United States. Um, they're a white breed that is actually more of a meat breed. Um, they have large fluffy ears. They're also old, but I think what's interesting about them is that they were developed, their name was derived from the county fair. Because there was two producers that brought pigs to a county fair. I think this is just funny with, with who's on our call with you kids is that they brought two pigs to the county fair and the judge named them. And he named them the Chester County um, pig, that's what he did. So Chester White County pig is what he called them. And then soon the county was dropped and they just become Chester White. So I think that's quite interesting. The Chester White is a heavy muscled ass Um And as any white pig, they're super, um, can be sunburned easily, so they need to definitely have shade. Some red pigs um, that were developed in the United States um, was the Duroc. And they are the red pig that has the droopy ears. The ears are how you're gonna tell these red pigs apart. Is there's the droopy ears. They're large to medium frame. Um, they are a very docile breed. What does docile mean? We learned this last night from Dr. Paisley talked about docile. Like not aggressive? Yeah, they're calm pigs. Um, 
they're the pig that some 4-H kids, if, a, if 4-H kids wants a really calm pig, their very first year, Doricks are great pigs for that. They don't always do the greatest in the show ring, but they definitely normally have that docile personality. So they were developed by crossing a pig called the Jersey Red and the New York um, Duroc. And what's interesting is that they really didn't start in the exhibition ring until 1950, which is not that long ago. So um, I think when you looked at some of the goat breeds Chad talked about is the dates, they're not that old, which is interesting. Even the boar goat to come to the United States isn't that long ago. So the Hereford pig is, is probably the pig that we um, was developed in the United States, but there's not very many of them. They're a rarer breed. There's less than 2,000 of them in the United States. Um, they can get large though. A boar can weigh up to 800 pounds, which is a pretty darn big pig. Um, and they were developed in the 1920, which seems like a long time ago, but it's not awfully long ago. We have grandparents that are still alive that were born then. So, or I do at least. And so anyways, they were born, or they were across from the Duroc and the Poland China is where they came. Um, a couple of others that were developed that you guys have commonly known as the Poland China. Um, it's one of the oldest American breeds. Um, it's black with white patches on it. And it was a cross between the Berkshire and the Hampshire. We're gonna talk about Berkshire and Hampshires, but basically they were imported, they were crossed, and then the, Ber the Poland chine was developed. Um, I think this is just an amazing fact on there. I just thought it was quite interesting that the largest Poland chine weighed over 2,000 pounds. That's a pretty dang big pig. Like I can't even imagine how big that is. That's a ton of hay. So if you guys can put that in perspective, actually a ton and a quarter of hay. So that's like amazing that, it, I don't even know how the pig could move, but. Um, the other one that's pretty common in the United States today, and especially in the show ring part, is that spotted pig. And they are one of the newer breeds um, that was developed in the United States. It was developed in Indiana, and they crossed a breed called Big China with Poland China. Then they kept crossing those Poland China. There was a variety of Poland Chinas, and they kept crossing them until they, they developed their own breed called the Spotted. Um, they've grown in popularity because they're fast gainers. They have a high feed efficiency, which means even more so than the other pigs. And we talked about that's less feed to more pounds of gain and obviously their meat quality. So those are the popular breeds that you guys know and are aware of that were developed in the United States. Now we're gonna kind of jump ship and talk about some maybe you've never heard of. Um, some that probably most of you maybe have never seen. Chad maybe has seen these. I don't know if there's wild pigs in Arizona, but I believe there is. So no, he's saying no. So there's a lot of them in the Oklahoma, Texas world. When I went to school in Texas, I had the opportunity to see a few of these, but um, we have some friends that live in Oklahoma and a few of them live there, but um, there's definitely a difference between a feral hog that we talked about, which is the wild pig that is not domesticated versus these breeds of pigs. So even though they look alike, um, they are very much different. So um, please know that because some people could get uh, anxious if you called their pig a feral hog. And so um, this, um, and I truly do not know how to pronounce this properly. I tried to call Judy, our friend that lives in Oklahoma, because she raises these pigs to get it right, but I'm gonna admit that I'm gonna pronounce it wrong. But the Choctaw, it's, it's the Native American Indians that, that have the majority of these pigs. Um, and they are the oldest pig that was developed in the United States that hasn't changed. So it's the most primitive type breed there is, which is interesting to me. There are very small pigs, um, less than 120 pounds at, at finish, which is not big at all. Um, if you look, I wish you could see their feet. I couldn't find a picture that had their feet on there, but they have fused toes, so they have a single hoof, kind of like a horse or a mule or that type of thing. We're going to talk about a mule toe pig in a minute, but they're related to the mule toe pig, which is the same way. And they also have these waddles. So if you guys can see those little waddles there underneath their, their neck. Um, and so they were brought over, oh, there's a typo. They were brought over by the Spaniards, um, and then they were developed and crossed and became their own breed in Oklahoma, and that's where they are still today. Um, they still run roam freely in Oklahoma um, on ranches down there, and they do a gathering much as they did in the early settlers that we talked about as far as to get them and then process them. Um, a couple other type of pigs that fall in that category is the guinea hog, which I've never even seen before. I actually had to look this one up, so this is a new breed to me that I looked because I wanted to make sure and get the ones that originated in the United States. Um, so the guinea hog is, um, came from West Africa. Um, they said they're different because they have the curly tail and the upright ears. They're also a small pig, not as small as those Oklahoma pigs though. Um, they're about 200 pounds and they were brought over with the sleighs and they were crossed on a pig, um, the Essex, Essex pig um, to develop their own. And they're very rare in the United States. There's less than 200 of them around. 
Um, the other pig that lives in the south is called the red wattle pig. And they're a large breed. If you guys compare that, is that guinea pig gets full grown at 200 and this red wattle pig is six to 800 pounds, which is huge. Um, they can get as big as 1200. So that's one of the largest breeds there are. Um, what's interesting about them though, is that they're a newer breed that was developed in the 1960 and 70, 1970 in Texas. Um, they were across from the Duroc pig and they have an average litter size of 10 to 15 which is pretty big for these type of pigs. Like a guinea hog is down a smaller litter size. The Oklahoma pig is a smaller litter size. Um, these became common and why they, they developed them and still continue to raise them is that they're disease resistant. Um, and they are growing, they're still not huge numbers, but they're growing to the point that they got their own association in 2012, which is not that long ago. Um, so the last two pigs that were developed, like originating in the United States is that mill footed pig that is related to the Oklahoma pig. Um, the difference is, is they are mo mainly always black and they once in a while have some white marking on them. But they're black where the Oklahoma pig can be a variety of colors. Um, they have erect floppy ears. And in my world, that's kind of a direct uh, contradictive thing because we teach kids to tell pigs apart whether they have erect ears or floppy ears. And these are ones where they say they are erect floppy, which means that they have an erect at the base and then they flap at the top so they're a larger, a large ear. Um, they have a very small litter size, five to six pigs, which is pretty small. Um, in 1976 is when their registry closed because of the fact that they didn't have enough pigs to continue with it and they're still less than 200. So in the United States, there's three pigs that are on the watch list if for say because they, um, are worried they're gonna be extinct. There's conservation um, societies that are trying to keep them alive. And one of them is the meal foot pig. And there's a guy in the Midwest that is specifically trying to rebirth this breed and restore it and make sure that it doesn't die and become a non-existent in the United States. So I think that's an interesting fact. So um, this other breed is one that's interesting I'm putting on there. And honestly, I know nothing about, but I thought this was really interesting because I really learned this breed, I hate to admit to you, like two weeks ago. But it's interesting to me. I wanted to learn more and share with you guys and I had a hard time and maybe Chad knows I had a hard time of finding out today what it means to develop a breed of pig in the United States and what I mean by that is is in dogs the American Kennel Club gets to decide whether a new breed is developed or you know crossbreeding resulted in a new breed in rabbits it's the ARBA the American Rabbit Breeders Association developed breeds and in order to be a recognized rabbit breed in the United States is you have to follow certain criteria in the rabbit according to ARBA to become your latest breed. So for example, some of you guys have been in this a while maybe took the rabbit um, lecture as it was the newest one is the lion head rabbit that wasn't a breed like six years ago and now it's a new rabbit breed. However, it's not quite clear cut and dried in pigs. So I really tried to research this and I still don't know and I still at some point find the answer for you. I even called the National Registry to try to figure out how a pig breed is, is developed and they couldn't tell me. So I think that's interesting. But this new Idaho Pasture Pigs has a new association. Um, you can Google it, they have their website, you can become a member, you can get registration papers. It's really interesting to me. So it's the newest, newest, newest pig um, breed and they have a very specific description on their website of what can be a, considered an Idaho Pasture Pig and and one of their big things that they are is that they only want pigs that are based on temperament, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and so they developed this breed by crossing a Duroc, a Berkshire, and a pig called Kung Kung. So um, this picture here on the bottom is this idle pasture pig. They look a lot like a Kung Kung pig to me. Um, anyway, so I think that's interesting. They can have waddles or not. They have that upright, floppy, erect ear, just like that meal foot, which is interesting, and they vary in, in color. So how I learned about this breed is, honestly, I was on this. Um, Katie's from Uinta County, so she might have heard of KSL Classifieds. It is out of Salt Lake, and there was a producer trying to sell these Idaho pasture pigs, and he was claiming they were purebred, and, and they were registered, and I had to really go Google it and research myself because I didn't know that there was such a thing. So anyway, so I share that with you as a new thing. Um, so from there though, I really wanted to just highlight the last four really common breeds, well there's five, that are common in the United States that didn't develop in the United States because they make up a large percentage of the pigs that are actually raised in the US. So um, 
one of those is the Hampshire pigs and you guys that are in 4-H with pigs is this is a very common exhibition type pig. Um, they are black with a white stripe and to make them registered, they have to have that white front leg. So lots of times when kids are in a show ring and they say oh, the Hampshire pig is oftentimes they don't have a purebred Hampshire pigs because it doesn't have the correct markings to it. So um, they have the erect ears um, and they're from England. They're known for heavy muscle and good, good temperament. So as we move forward, what I want you guys to learn is that every pig breed that has Shire in the name, so Hampshire, Berkshire, Yorkshire, all of the Shires have erect ears. So that's how you're gonna tell a Shire pig. So as you have to look at two white pigs side by side, that can help you to, to decide who is who, or two black pigs side by side, that can help determine the breed is the, that ear structure. Um, the Berkshire pig is an average to large frame pig. It has rather short legs, uh, erect ears, black, black um, feet, nose, tail. So we just had this conversation when we were at, at Arizona. There were some kids competing in the livestock skill fund contest, and they said the six black or the six white points and what they are. So the six white points are what? Four feet, a snout, and a tail. So if you ever say they're the black pig with the six white points, it's a Berkshire. Um, and then the pea train is a pig that's really grown in popularity in the United States. Um, and then other times it's kind of crashed is, is really, it's one of those breeds that, that um, if you go research it, you can't really figure out where it came from. It's kind of an unknown origin. And, and that happens as Chad even shared in the goat breed is that, that oftentimes it's hard to backtrack where they specifically came from. But they're fairly new. They first appeared in the 1920s, grew in massive popularities in the 50s. Then they kind of went crashed it kind of a little bit as far as popularity because they were super heavy muscled and what crashed them in the United States does anybody know why the pea train breed went for a while anybody guess maybe in the I'd say in maybe 15 years ago does anybody have a guess does anybody know what kind of gene that they carried and they brought to the United States they have a guess it's called the stress gene the pea train breed was common for the stress gene which um, became kind of um, a critical thing that occurred in the show world is the stress gene came about and, and it was at first thought it came from the Pia train breed and now that's not proven at all. Does that make sense? But they were, some of the genetics carried them and so they kind of crashed it and, and people used them a lot in their, in their crossbreeding, crossbreeding um, operations and then they kind of backtracked them a bit. They're back to using them quite heavily as, as crossbreds. Um, they usually use a sire as far as a crossbred type, um, but they're not normally bred um, for show ring type of thing. There's a lot of them showed in the show ring, but usually as a crossbred and not a purebred. So um, the other two breeds um, that one is common that you guys probably know, and then the other one is that pet breed we're going to talk about, but is the Yorkshire. And uh, the Yorkshire breed is interesting to me. If you look at the Shire, they have the erect ears. Again, this is a big Yorkshire pig, so hers are maybe not quite as erect, but they, they have an erect ear. Um, they're long and lean, and they're great mamas. So um, this should not be Yorkshire. This should say land race. I'm sorry. I put Yorkshire on there, but it should say land race. Sorry. Um, the, the land race, I really have that wrong. It should say land race. The first land race brought into, um, were from the Danish, and I think it's interesting that they were imported in the United States in 1930. Um, and the U.S. imported them on with a, um, a contract that said they could only be used for research. So they could not use them into commercial operations. And so the United States continued to work with the Danish um, I assume a research center, their government, I'm not quite sure who the contract was with, but they continued to work with them to get that retracted, and that was retracted in 1949, which is not very long ago when we consider how many um, land races there are in the United States. So land race should have a floppy year, I spelled that. Um, and the other thing that's interesting about the land race is that there's like 15 different varieties of land race. So if you Google breeds of pigs, there's a Japanese land race, a Norwegian land race, a Swedish, like there's tons of them out there, 15 different ones. Um, the American land race that we know um, was developed from those Danish pigs that came in and they were crossed with the Norwegian, a Swedish, and a little bit of Poland China. So they're very prolific mo uh, moms. They, they reproduce, they have large litters, they are great milk producers, but 
one thing about them that's interesting and probably why maybe they don't lead the number of pigs um, in the United States as far as the, the number out there, the Yorkshire does, is because their milk peaks at five weeks, which means that that's their heaviest milk production at five weeks compared to a lot of those other breeds we talked about. And who knows today, how old are baby pigs today when they're weaned? Does anybody know? Maybe have a guess. Are you guys all sleeping in there? Well, it's I'll, okay. Go it's, ahead, Caitlin. What? How about three? Yeah, that's a great guess, right? So, in the commercial pig operations, many pigs are weaned at three to four weeks, right? So, when we think of a land race pig, is that this five-week peak is almost a little late, right? In the in the scheme of things. So I would imagine over time with crossbreeding and research, this will change and they'll, they'll retain genetics that'll make it so that, that they can maintain that great milk production, that prolificity, but yet make them so that they become the healthier milk producers when it's really prime. So anyways, that's just an interesting fact. Um, from there, I put the pot pig on here because of the fact that that is the, I would call the common pet to city people. <laughs> so the pot pig is it just a, it is a pet pig, honestly. Um, they're not used for much of anything else. Um, it's interesting that the first one in this, I didn't realize it was this early. It was imported in the United States in 1980 from Canada and really came from a zoo, which is interesting. Um, and the pot belly pig for say in the world is there's a lot of different breeds. There's like 16 of them. And the ones in the United States are definitely like, you couldn't say they're a purebred pot belly pig. There's not like probably that because they've crossbred it and they've imported a lot of those other um, varieties from China and Vietnam and things like that. So sometimes you'll see a advertised a Vietnam or Vietnamese potbelly pig. And I would always question whether they're gonna be purebred. That's kind of one of those things. And um, they've also taken them and on the bottom here, I put that smallest domestic pig is the gotten, um, gotten gin, I guess is how you pronounce that. But the reason I put that on there is because a lot of the people that want these pigs to live at their house have crossbred them with this really tiny pig of trying to take a potbelly pig, which is, is it's not super small, it's not large, large, but and trying to make even a mini, like those teacup pigs that you see advertised and things like that. Um, one of the challenges with the pot belly pigs is that they have a very long lifespan, which is interesting, 15 to 20 years, which is a long time. So oftentimes what happens is people get this pot belly pig and think it's a great pet. And then all of a sudden it grows and it's not that tiny little thing. And then it has to live in their house or they take and, and put it in their backyard and, and want it to be like a dog. And um, what do pigs do to dirt? We learned at the very beginning. They put rings in their nose because they what? Somebody jump in there. What do they do? Uproot. Yeah, they uproot. So that's what happens with these potbelly pigs is they put them in their backyards and they kind of destroy their grass and things like that. Then all of a sudden they want to get rid of them. So we find a lot of potbelly pigs in, uh, um, what are they called? I want to say kennels, but that's not the word I'm looking for. Uh, Whatever, the city people get them. I don't know what the word is, I can't think of it, but anyways. Um, so that's kind of it about uh, pigs. Um, what I hope from you guys is that we gave you a rash. I went through that rather quickly because I think that um, today in the United States is there's not a whole lot of purebred pigs. Um, there's seed stock operations out there that are raising them as we've seen at the beginning, but the majority of the pigs in the United States today are crossbred. Um, the majority in the commercial operations are, and the majority in the show ring are. Um, in the exhibition world is that there's a lot um, that are possibly shown at like World Park Expo and those type of things that have to be purebred, but the majority of the pigs are gonna be crossbred. So hopefully what you learned by just as a snapshot of all those pigs is that there's a few things that we can do when we look at a pig though, to try to determine the breed. So who can tell me one of them? I was gonna look at the pig, I said it a couple times. So if I wanted to know one breed from another, what is one identifying factor I could tell? Color? Color, absolutely, Sometimes. right? Absolutely. So some of them have distinctive colors, and then others like the spot in the pea train can be a variety of anything, right? Okay, so color's one, what's another one? Ears. Ears is another one, great. What's another one? Structure and conformation. Yep, structure and conformation, right? Absolutely. Um, they're definitely built different and, and you can also look at those. The other part is, is if you ever can read, obviously you can look at where they are, the country of origin. Um, you can ask producers. 
But oftentimes, I think we do what when we decide what breed a pig is? We guess. So I think um, for you guys that show pigs and you go buy a pig from a show ring pig, uh, the majority of those are not going to be purebred. So we look at them and we try to guess by their color, by whether they have added markings like those six white points or whether they have the erect or the floppy ear, and we guess. So I always say when somebody says, what is that pig's breed? I'm always fearful to ever say what breed it is because of the fact that um, it, you can't truly tell by, you can guess, but you can't probably truly tell. So um, with that, I just have a few fun facts just for, oh, and it worked. I'm so excited my picture worked. So I just wanted to conclude tonight with just a few fun facts about pigs. Um, I know some of you guys raise pigs and sometimes pigs do things that we don't know why or how or what behavior it is and so I think it's interesting as you just learn about pigs is that um, when I said feral hogs still exist and they're not a breed so um, they are often trapped and hunted to try to control them they're super destructive um, I know that we have a friend in Oklahoma and she would love anybody to go hunting in any world because those things are terrible um, down there but uh, the interesting th thing though is we think of pigs in, and we put them in crates when they have babies. Um, feral hogs that are wild um, build nests and put their babies in twigs, grasses, leaves. I think that's interesting. Um, a distinctive behavior of pigs is that tea orders decided right after birth and um, often it's biggest to smallest. Whoever, because pig production, milk production is uh, higher at, at uh, one end of their, their production cycle than the other, which is interesting. Um, the nose is, is an important part of the pig, and I think this is interesting, is that the nose is made up of a um, prenasal bone, and then it's covered by cartilage, and um, they learn to root as this little pig is rooting here when they're um, nursing when they're little, but then it becomes like a habit, and it's also a calming effect to them. Um, they also use that to gather food, and it helps them cover in mud, and we're going to talk about mud in just a minute because I think it's connected, so they use that to bury themselves in mud. Um, I think it's interesting to think that sows nurse their young every 50 to 60 minutes. That's a lot. Like that's quite often. So those mamas work hard at keeping those babies going. I think that's interesting. Um, just a fun fact, pigs have 44 teeth, which is a lot. Pigs have 16 toes, four on each hoof. And so that's a great question. Those are like those trivia questions they like to ask in a show ring type of a thing. So I know a lot of you guys show, so I put those in there because of that. Um, females reproduce, um, become reproductive at three to 12 months, what does that mean? Who knows what that means? What does that statement mean? Oh, I didn't mean to go back. Females can reproduce at three to 12 months, which means that they can what? They become mature at that point. What does that mean? Anybody? They can have young at that age. They can. Yeah, which is pretty young, right? So three months old, wow, that's crazy. And that's also why they're in confinement separated is that they can reproduce. That's also why feral hogs, connection point is is reproduced so quickly is because of that. Um, they have an estrus that is about every 18 to 24 days. That's similar, not the exact same, but to sheep and goats. Um, and they last in estrus for about two to three days, which is, is longer. And they gestation is three months, three weeks, three days. So you can remember three, three, three. Just a couple other little things that are interesting, I think connected to that snout is that um, pigs ideal temperature is 61 to 72 degrees. That's why we don't raise a lot, a ton of pigs in Wyoming. We do have a few corporate farms in it, but the weather just for hobbyist farmers or small backyard farmers, there's not a ton of them because of the fact our temperatures are very cold. Um, pigs have sweat glands, but they mainly appear on their snout and they can't use their sweat glands to cool themselves like uh, other animals do. So, and they can't pant like a dog pants. And so, the reason why pigs wall are in mud is because it is the way that they actually do cool themselves. So when we don't allow them to do that um, in nature, they do that. Um, they also wall in that mud to, to so they don't get sunburned as we talked about some of those breeds do. Also in wild pigs, the way that they mark their territory in, in, in essence with the scent. So that snout becomes super important to their animal behavior part. Um, just an interesting fact that pigs um, are um, like venom sna snakes like can't kill them like the same as it can kill a human. Um, and so that's why they can get along great in the wild is that there's, there's predators like that that typically um, have an effect on other animals that don't have an effect on a snake like a horse is get its bit, that's a huge deal. Um, and then just the last fun little fact that I think is interesting is that 
for you guys that have pigs is that when you get those little baby pigs into Wyoming and it's the middle of March or April and it's freezing cold out and we continue to stay to bed them down, get heat lamps on them and things like that is because of that temperature at 61 to 72 degrees. But the other part is pigs have really small lungs, which means that they're very susceptible to um, bronchitis and pneumonia. And so that becomes a, a problem for those pigs. So anyways, just a few fun facts. It's a little off of breeds, but um, I think it's important that we learn about breeds and why we have the breeds that we have um, in the United States. It also um, helps us as far as when we're identifying them and things like that. So, but um, any, does anybody have questions? Is everybody there? I just realized in the, I wasn't monitoring the chat box that Morgan froze. Katie, did you hear any of that? I don't know. Maybe we froze part of them. Yeah, you heard it. Oh, okay, very good. Maybe it's just Morgan's froze. I thought, oh my gosh. So, okay. Does anybody have questions about pigs? All right. So tonight was a little longer than we expected that because we were do covering two things. Um, so with that, thanks for getting on. Just a couple reminders. Um, is that be sure and go take your quiz. The quiz is posted from last night's lecture. Um, the video is not up yet. So like Caitlin that wasn't on last night, I don't have the video posted yet for last night's lecture, but I will get that done tomorrow. And so it should be up. Um, for you guys that were on last night's lecture with Dr. Paisley is your quiz is up and ready to go. Um, the quiz for tonight will be up by tomorrow afternoon. I'll get it up in the morning, but um, it'll be up by tomorrow afternoon. And so you guys can take the quiz. My point, and I said it last night to you, is my encouragement is to go do it um, well right after the lecture. Otherwise, you get to go watch it again to try to get your answers. You're going to have to Google them or something. So um, hopefully that what is on that quiz is covered in the lecture. So if you do them back to back, it definitely maybe is a little easier for you guys. Um, with that, too, is that I said it last night, if you guys have any questions as far as, as um, labs or you're concerned about getting labs or anything like that, please let me know. Um, Rebecca shot me an email today and I, I worked on getting her question answered and I'll follow up with the rest of that Rebecca tomorrow when I get the rest of that answered for you. So with that, I thank you guys. I thanks Chad for getting on and staying and listening to pigs, but um, hopefully y'all learned something. And with that, you guys have a good night. Remember your next lecture. I'll release the one that comes from um, Dr. Lake Scott Lake as soon as I get that one. So I can't say that you won't have one um, next month because hopefully we'll get one scheduled next month but currently you don't have one scheduled till March and then April will be the last one so um, with that you guys have a good night and thanks for getting on thank you Nan yep